I'm Laura. And I'm Tim. And we're some of the leaders here at Vineyard 53. A huge welcome to everyone watching this morning, but especially if you're new to church, you're exploring faith, or you've just clicked on. We're so glad you're here. Yeah, we really are. We are Vineyard 53. We're a church on an adventure. We're inviting people into relationship with Jesus and each other and seeking transformation in every part of life. Yeah, we'd love to know, let you know what's coming up this morning. So we're going to start with a short time of worship and um, we're going to sing songs to Jesus and about him. Feel free to stand up and get involved or perhaps you'd just rather um, listen to the lyrics. After that we're going to have some announcements, then a break and then we'll have a short talk. Yeah, but just as we start, I'm going to pray. Jesus, we love you and we want to worship you this morning. We ask that you'd come and make yourself known to us today. Would you come and be close to us? Would we know you better? And would we be transformed in your presence? Amen. Amen.
some of the leaders here at Vineyard 53 and again you're so welcome we're so glad you're here whether 
you've been here loads of times before, this is your first time you're visiting, and especially if you're exploring faith and you just happen to click on this morning, we're really so glad you're here, you're so welcome. If that last category is you, you've got questions, you're exploring faith, then we'd love to signpost you to some resources and you'll find them in the link below this video. If you've got questions and the like, then you'll find that down below. Also, by following that link, you can find uh, a way for us to give you a Bible. We'd love to give you a free copy of the New Testament. So follow the link below and soon enough, one will appear at your door. Yeah, that's great. So a few things we want to let you know about this morning. The first is something that's happening this evening at 7pm. We're calling it What's Your Story? Wellbeing. And this is the chance to hear three people's um, real life stories on their journey of well-being. So that's going to be really great. Um, do watch that along tonight. We're going to be premiering it on our Facebook page and our YouTube channel. Um, invite your friends along. So that's 7pm tonight. Yeah, wonderful. And the other thing to let you know about is that our youth work is expanding. So we had two youth groups previously. There are now three. So if you've got a child um, school year five and above, email youth at vineyard53 to get some of the more details there. Um, but yeah, all really exciting, I think. Yeah, it is. So now we're going to head into a short break. It's going to be about the duration of a song. Um, why don't you text someone you've not heard from in a while um, or maybe just grab um, another drink. And after that, we will have a talk. Great. Bye bye. Bye. Good morning. Thank you for joining us here this morning. If you don't know me, I'm Graham. Uh, it's our privilege and our pleasure to have you have you join us. Um, I imagine most of us will have had the experience at some point in our lives of moving into a new house. It can be quite an exciting thing. And uh, usually there's this process whereby we uh, kind of change this house that we're renting or that we've bought into a home, something more than just the bricks and mortar. And uh, for all of us, that process looks a bit different. For some of us, it's maybe to do with getting some, um, some like favorite pictures or family photos up on the wall. Um, for others, it might be to do with getting the furnishings right. And maybe for others, it's about the bedroom area, making sure we have a really great environment for getting a good night's sleep. Um, but of course, these days, 
all of those things are kind of immaterial compared to the one thing that's an absolute necessity before any of us feel comfortable in a new place. And that, of course, is the Wi-Fi, the one thing that none of us can do without. Um, I remember when uh, my wife and I were first married and we moved into our first home together, I was given this crucial job of getting us connected to the World Wide Web. It, um, I don't think it was even the Wi-Fi back then. It sort of says something about your age when you have like internet nostalgia, but there we go. And so I, I rang around these various service providers and, uh, and I thought I'd found us this really good deal whereby we got the landline, which was a thing back then as well, and, uh, and the internet all bundled together, great price, way cheaper than anyone else was going to do us. It seemed too good to be true. And uh, as it turned out, it was too good to be true. The company sent us a router and they got us a number and everything and we connected everything up and um, nothing. Uh, didn't connect. So I rang up and they basically said, oh, we've, we've made a mistake. Actually, we can't do the internet in your area. Sorry. Um, so I was back to square one. Had to start all over again, connect up with someone else. But then after that, quite an odd thing happened. Um, like a couple of months later, this phone bill dropped through the door from this first company that we never got connected with. And, uh, and it was just to me and I opened it up and and it was very, very large and very, very weird with like phone calls to Nigeria in the middle of the night and stuff like that. And, uh, and I thought, well, I'd better ring up and, and check about this. So I, I rang up. But I should say at this point that when I said it was addressed to me, that wasn't strictly speaking true because my surname is Lindsay with an L. And the name on the envelope was Mr. Minzy with an M, which made the conversation that I had with the guy in the call center pretty confusing. Um, I sort of rang up and said, oh, I've had this bill, but it's not meant for me. We're not actually even one of your customers. And this guy said, all right, so what's your name, sir? I said, Mr. Lindsay. And he said, and you're, you're the name on the bill? And I was like, well, yeah. I mean, it actually says Mr. Minzy on the bill. And he's like, all right, you're Mr. Minzy. I said, no, I'm not. I'm, not Mr. I'm called Mr. Lindsay. It's, it's probably just a, a type or whatever. And he's like, right, so you're not Mr. Mr. Minzy. And I was like, well, no, but... But it is, it is kind of meant for me. And he's like, right, so are you Mr. Minzy? And I was like, no, 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 I'm, I'm not Mr. Minzy. I'm called Mr. Lindsay. And he's like, gotcha. Okay, so we need to find out who this Mr. Minzy guy is. And I was like, I, d I don't think there is a Mr. Minzy. I think it was just a typo. And we basically, we had that conversation over and over again for what felt like several days until both of us were just kind of totally confused. Why am I telling you this story? Well, it's simply to say this, that it matters who people are. Being able to properly identify someone is important because when we're interacting with someone, it helps to have a good understanding of who that person is. Now, obviously, in the grand scheme of things, it doesn't really matter if a call center operator knows what my proper surname is. But there are situations where it does matter. Like, I don't relate to my work colleagues in the same way that I relate to my mother-in-law because that would be weird. We're in the middle, at the moment, of a series looking at the book of Mark, a book that was written in the first century. It's from the Bible, and it's basically an eyewitness account, a biography of the life of Jesus. We've been working our way through it, looking at all the things that Jesus said, his teaching, the healings, the miracles that he did, what he said about forgiveness, what he said about the kingdom of God. Essentially, what it was like for those who were there at the time to encounter Jesus. And in looking at that, we've been trying to think about what it means for us to encounter Jesus today. Right back in week one, John spoke about how Mark lays all his cards on the table at the start of his book. His opening line is, the beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. Mark has clearly identified who Jesus is. And implicitly, he's asking us who we are. It's, it's basically the thrust of his whole book. And today, we're going to look at a conversation that Jesus had with his disciples, that looks at that exact subject. So, let's have a look at Mark chapter 8, and we'll start reading at verse 27. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, who do people say I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Peter answered, you are the Messiah. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. So what's going on here? Well, 
up to now, we've had all these amazing moments, all this stuff that we've been looking at over the first few weeks of this series. And evidently, Jesus has become a bit of a topic of conversation among the general public as news of everything has started to spread. So Jesus asks his disciples, who've been with him the whole time, what are people saying about me? Who, who do they say I am? And they give him a few answers. Firstly, they say John the Baptist, who we met in week one. He's actually been killed by this point, but some people seem to think that he's back from the dead. Uh, then they say Elijah. Elijah uh, was a prophet from what we now call the Old Testament, the bit of the Bible from before Jesus' time on earth. And we'll talk a little bit more about him in a bit. And then finally, the uh, disciples say that some people think he's another Old Testament prophet. It's interesting, isn't it, that there wasn't really a clear consensus back then on who Jesus is. Even the disciples who, who'd been around him and seen all this stuff weren't 100% clear who Jesus was. And if you ask people that same question today, what, what do you believe about Jesus? You still don't get a clear consensus. I mean, you'll get some people who will say that, you know, he was the son of God, but you're probably just as likely to hear people say that he was just a, a good teacher or maybe a bit of a, a rebel who upset the Romans. But actually, what anyone else thinks about Jesus is, is kind of irrelevant because the issue for all of us is, what do I think? What do I believe about who Jesus was? And uh, as if to make that point clear, Jesus immediately flips the question round and asks it to his disciples. What about you? Who do you say I am? And here most of them seem to go quiet except one guy called Peter. Now, Peter's a bit of a hero of mine. Uh, I'm endlessly fascinated by him. He's this really interesting New Testament figure. And, uh, and I just love reading about interesting people. A while ago, a guy called Matthew Barrett went viral on Twitter when he tweeted this guy surely has the best opening paragraph of any Wikipedia biography ever, with a link to the wiki entry for Lieutenant General Sir Adrian Paul Gislaine Carton Duart. And this is how that opening paragraph reads. Lieutenant General Sir Adrian Paul Gislaine Carton Duart, VC, KBE, CB, CMG, DSO, was a British Army officer born of Belgian and Irish parents. He was awarded the Victoria Cross, the highest military decoration awarded for valour in the face of the enemy in various Commonwealth countries. He served in the Boer War, First World War and Second World War. He was shot in the face, head, stomach, ankle, leg, hip and ear, was blinded in his left eye, survived two plane crashes, tunnelled out of a prisoner of war camp and tore off his own fingers when a doctor refused to amputate them. Describing his experiences, he wrote... Frankly, I'd enjoyed the war. Now, as interesting as the esteemed Lieutenant General undoubtedly sounds, I would argue that Peter is a much more compelling character. He would eventually go on to become a great leader, a pioneer in the early church. But that's not actually why I love him so much. Um, because whilst he could be kind of bold and adventurous and display these amazing moments of faith, the thing I love is that he, he just as often got things wrong. He's usually, as in this instant, the first person to speak up at any given moment, but he, he quite often just says the wrong thing anyway. In fact, for a biblical hero, he's reassuringly average. And yet this reassuringly average guy is stood next to Jesus during kind of all the most major moments of Jesus' life. Let's consider some of the stuff Peter has gone through just in the first half of Mark. We meet him in chapter 1. He's called Simon at this point, and he's a fisherman. It's a pretty mundane job. And yet he's one of the first people that Jesus calls to follow him. And his response is, sure, he drops the nets, off he goes. Soon after that, Peter takes Jesus, along with all the other disciples, back to his house where his mother-in-law is sick. I've always been kind of curious about this moment and about how the conversation went between Peter and his wife, because Mark doesn't include it in the book. But I wouldn't imagine that Peter's wife is terribly thrilled to find out that he's binned off the fishing business and he's now part of this motley crew of people that are following Jesus around. Oh, and by the way, is it, is it cool if they all stay for dinner? It's probably just as well that Jesus immediately heals Peter's mother-in-law. Anyway, Peter then goes on to see loads more amazing healings and other miracles. Uh, there's a moment when Peter is worried he's about to get shipwrecked until Jesus calms the storm that's threatening their boat. That, that happens in chapter 4. Uh, he's in the room when Jesus brings a young girl back to life in uh, chapter 5. And then in chapter 6, Jesus sends Peter and the other disciples out to preach. And they end up healing a load of people. Uh, he then 
Later in that chapter, sees Jesus multiply loaves and fishes to feed 5,000 people. And then immediately after that, sees Jesus walk on water, the story that we heard Alison talking about last week. So in my view, Peter's Wikipedia page would be way more interesting than Lieutenant General Sir Adrian Paul Gislaine Carton do arts. Although he does actually have a Wikipedia page and the opening paragraph just says he was a disciple and a leader in the early church, which frankly sells him a bit short if you ask me. But anyway, the point is this. If you want to see what happens when you encounter Jesus, you need look no further than this guy, Peter. This is someone who life, whose life gets turned upside down from the moment he leaves those nets on the beach. And whatever he may have initially thought about Jesus, he's now at this point where he's like, you are the Messiah. It's kind of difficult for us with our Western 21st century worldview to realize the significance of what Peter is saying here. I mean, it doesn't necessarily sound like that big a deal because we don't really have a lot of Messiah chat these days. But for first century Jews, this was, this was actually huge. We know, of course, that it's a big deal for Mark that Jesus was the Messiah because he, uh, he mentions it right at the start of the book, as we've said a couple of times now. Uh, but he's actually he's re-emphasizing that here using this story. He, we're about halfway through Mark's book, and he, and he puts this conversation here at this particular point as a kind of pivot between the first and the second halves of his book. In the first half, he's been focusing on kind of laying out the evidence that Jesus is the Messiah through the kind of healing and teaching of his early ministry. And then as we move forward, he's going to talk more about what Jesus said about the kind of Messiah he would be. And separating these two halves is this exchange where Jesus says, who do you say I am? And Peter makes this big declaration, you are the Messiah. It's kind of a watershed moment. If Mark were adapted like, into a play, then this would be the bit just before the interval, the kind of big climax. And, uh, you know, if this was like an episode of EastEnders, then this moment would happen just before one of the do, 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 moments. So why is it such a big deal? Well, the Jews in Jesus' day believed that God was going to send an anointed king who would rise up and free Israel, uh, defeat their oppressors at the time Israel was being ruled by the Romans, and bring God's kingdom to bear on earth. Uh, and this was based upon various prophecies from the Old Testament. Now, no one knew exactly where or when this anointed king was going to appear, but they would use these Old Testament prophecies to kind of come up with theories about what he would be like and how he would appear and all sorts of other stuff. For example, if you remember uh, when the disciples said that some people were saying Jesus was Elijah. Now, Elijah was around like centuries before Jesus. So why on earth would people think that he was Elijah? Well, the reason is that one of the theories that people had about the anointed king was that before he could appear, Elijah had to return. So the coming of the anointed king is like a major part of the cultural narrative at that time. And uh, the word for anointed king in the, in the uh, Jewish languages, Hebrew and Aramaic, is the word that we now pronounce Messiah. Around then, there were plenty of people who would claim to be the Messiah. But as you might imagine, the local Roman authorities weren't too keen on revolutionaries with ideas of power, and so they clamped down on it pretty quickly. If you were you know, a budding Messiah, you'd pretty soon find yourself rounded up by the fuzz. And this helps explain the bit of the conversation that I'd always found kind of confusing. I never really understood the bit where Jesus says to his disciples, don't tell anyone about me, because... For me, if you're the Messiah, if you're like the long-awaited saviour, then why would you want to keep it on the down low? Surely you want to be out there, like building up your brand. But the reason is that Jesus' idea of what the Messiah is going to look like is, is very different from the general consensus, as we'll see in a minute. And he has a plan of his own, and it's not going to be helped by the undoubted attention and pretty hostile attention that he'd receive if he became known as the latest would-be Messiah. So, what does Jesus' plan look like? Well, let's read on, continuing from verse 31. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. 
Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then he called the crowd to him, along with his disciples, and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Well now, this is a bit of a gear change from Jesus. The disciples must have been just totally confused. They've seen all these incredible healings, all these miracles. They've heard all this amazing teaching. They've got to this point where they're like, this is it. This is the guy. This is the long-awaited Messiah, the anointed king who's going to lead us to victory. And then suddenly, Jesus is talking about suffering and, and death, which doesn't really sound very victorious, to be perfectly honest. Jesus is telling the disciples what his version of the Messiah is going to look like, and it makes absolutely no sense to them. Now, it may shock you to hear this, but I actually cut my own hair. I, I know it looks very stylish and professional, but actually this is all done by my own hand. Um, I mean, not 100%. The, the bit that involves just kind of shearing it all off with a set of electric clippers, that, that bit I do myself. But the trouble is that there's always a few kind of stray hairs around the ears that need kind of tidying up afterwards, and that needs a little bit of finesse. And the problem I have is that I obviously can't see my ears, so I have to use a mirror. And for whatever reason, you'd think it would be kind of simple enough. You look in the mirror, you cut off the hairy bits, you avoid the eerie bits, but I just can't get my head around the fact that I'm looking at a reflection. Obviously, I know that I'm looking at a reflection, but for whatever reason, my brain can't compute that... In order to go left, I have to go right. And in order to go forward, I have to go backwards and all that sort of thing. And so my wife always has to do those bits for me because I'm, I'm fairly attached to my ears and I'd quite like them to stay attached to me. This is the level of head-scratching confusion that the disciples are feeling at this point. It's like they're saying, right, we need to go this way. And Jesus is going, okay, well, in order to do that, we need to go this way. Like left is right and right is left. Everything Jesus is telling them about the Messiah is the exact opposite of what they've always believed about the Messiah. He's not supposed to suffer. He's certainly not supposed to die. And so Peter decides that he's going to have a little word with Jesus, which, you know, is pretty inevitable, really. He's Peter. Of course, he's going to have a word. He's always the first to speak up. Here he goes again, can't help himself. So he decides to go and, and give Jesus a bit of a ticking off, which it's fair to say Jesus doesn't respond particularly well to in that he calls Peter Satan. Now, Jesus isn't actually saying that Peter is Satan. It's just that Jesus is so crystal clear about what his calling is. He will suffer. He will die in order to save the world. That is God's mission for his life. And it's not going to be easy. The temptation for Jesus to walk a different path would have been very, very real. But he knew that that wasn't God's plan. That would be the plan of God's enemy, Satan. So when Peter starts to suggest that, no, you don't, you don't have to do this stuff, he's actually inadvertently, without necessarily realizing it, playing the role of Satan, tempting Jesus to ignore God's call. In fairness to the disciples, this is all new to them. Jesus hasn't spoken about any of this stuff before. We've hit this pivot point, and as we move forward, Jesus is going to say a lot more about this sort of stuff, and we'll explore it more as we go through the series running up to Easter. But for now, the main thing to focus on is how Jesus is saying that the way that God thinks is totally different to the way that we think. God's plan is a mirror image of the disciples' plan. His kingdom works in the total opposite way to the way this world we live in works. And as Jesus goes on to say, that has massive implications for those who want to follow him. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. That's a huge claim. If you want to follow Jesus, really follow him, then you need to be prepared to give up everything, even your life. But in doing so, you'll receive life, life in the kingdom of God. So, what does all this mean for us today? Well, there are two questions that I think we can each ask ourselves as we reflect on this conversation between Jesus and his disciples. And the first is basically that question that Jesus asks them. Who do you say Jesus is? You may have been following Jesus 
for years. You may have never thought about this question before in your life. But either way, there really isn't a more important question for us to consider. Who we believe Jesus is, his identity, makes all the difference in how we respond as we encounter him. If he's just a good teacher, then okay, we can listen to what he says, but not necessarily pay it any more attention than anyone else. But if he is God's anointed king, the key player in the kingdom of God, well, that's a totally different ball game. Jesus himself was absolutely clear about who he was. You'll notice when he when he's talking to Peter and Peter says, you're the Messiah, he doesn't say, whoa, 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 hold the phone there. You got, you got the wrong end of the stick. No, no. He knows who he was and where he fits into God's uh, salvation plan for the, for the world. The author, uh, C.S. Lewis, said it very well when he said this. A man who was merely a man and said the sorts of things that Jesus says would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on a level with the man who says he is a poached egg. Or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman, or something worse. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. If Jesus is who he said he was, then we simply can't brush him off or ignore him. If he truly is the Messiah, God's anointed king, bringing his kingdom to bear on earth, then it would be foolish not to follow him. So first question, who do you say Jesus is? And the second question is this, if you've decided to follow him, then on whose terms are you following Jesus? If I wanted to get in shape or lose a bit of weight, I might hire a personal fitness instructor and that fitness instructor might uh, give me some exercises to do and he might give me a plan about um, you know, how often to do them and for how long. Um, they might make changes to my diet. They might suggest I you know, cut down on my caffeine or cut out alcohol or things like that. They might give me advice on kind of my sleep so that I'm just generally more healthy. They might do any number of things. But none of it would matter if I wasn't willing to work on their terms. You see, if I decided that actually I don't, I don't really enjoy exercise and I'm, I'm pretty fond of pies and you know, I can't really get through the day without 10 coffees, even though it does mean that I can't get to sleep at night, then the whole thing would be you know, pretty pointless, really, because it would just mean that I'm not really following the instructions at all. I want the benefits, but only on my own terms. And it, it just doesn't work like that. And it can be like that with Jesus. The idea of life in God's kingdom sounds great. Well up for that. But being prepared to give up everything? Mm, I'm not sure I'm prepared to work on those terms. I'm not sure I'm up for making sacrifices in my career in order to follow you, Jesus. I'm not sure I'm, I want you involved in my marriage. I'm certainly not interested in letting you get involved with my finances. And to be honest, I'm pretty happy with my relationships the way they are. It's a very appealing idea to follow Jesus on our own terms. And just to be clear, wherever you're at, the invitation to follow Jesus is open to all. You are invited to come as you are. And uh, Jesus will help you, work with you on your journey to let go of the things that are, are stopping you from making him the king of your life, if that's what you want. But Jesus says it plainly here. If we want the life he offers, the fullness of life in his kingdom, the opportunity to play our part in God's salvation plan for this world, then we need to be prepared to give up everything, to follow him on his terms and not ours. It's not easy. We're proud people. I mean, by our very nature, we all want to be in control of our own lives. I know I do. It's something we'll have to constantly grapple with, to say, your will, Jesus, not mine. And so I'd encourage you to think about what are the things that are preventing you from really following Jesus? What are the areas of your life that you need to recommit to him? One thing it's worth bearing in mind, incidentally, is that it becomes a lot easier to follow Jesus on his terms when we gain, have a better understanding of who he is. The more we understand just how much he loves us, just how much his plan for us 
is the best plan for us, then the easier it becomes to follow Jesus and give ourselves over to him. So, who do you say Jesus is? And on whose terms are you following him? I, uh, I want to finish with our friend Peter. Uh, Peter doesn't come out of this story particularly well here. Um, but interestingly, this book, Mark, it's kind of uh, Peter's version of events, really. Uh, Peter and Mark were close friends. And so while Mark wrote the book, Peter was actually the source. He gave Mark all the material uh, that he put in the book. So in many ways, it's kind of like Mark is ghostwriting Peter's story. And uh, with that being the case, it'd be, it'd be pretty easy for Peter to just kind of leave out the bits where he got things so hopelessly wrong that Jesus called him Satan. But he doesn't. And uh, for us reading it today, we're fortunate that he doesn't because it gives us a little bit of hope. You know, if Peter, who'd been with Jesus through all these incredible moments, could still get it that wrong, but then come back and learn what it truly meant to follow Jesus, to give everything for him, play a major role in the birth of his church, come through the other side, then surely, you know, there's hope for all of us that we can learn what it truly means to follow Jesus. Right then, I'd love to pray for us now as we finish. We'll be in different places as we, uh, as we come this morning, as we meet together. And uh, for some of us, we'll be in that place of just exploring, encountering Jesus for the first time and really wrestling with that question of who he is. And so, Lord, I ask that for those of us in that place, and indeed for all of us, would you just continue to reveal more and more of yourself, more and more of your love for us as we encounter you. And for some of us, we, uh, we know that we've not been following Jesus on his terms. We've been trying to kind of do things on our own terms. And, and so, Lord, we ask that you'd forgive us that and that you would gently and lovingly help us to correct course and uh, follow you on your terms. And uh, some of us know that there are specific things that we are desperate to give over to you, uh, but we just can't let go. And so, Lord, I pray that you'd give us the courage. Would you fill us with your spirit? Would you help us to give up those things that uh, we're clinging on to, Lord? And for all of us, Jesus, would you come and fill us with your spirit? Be with us this week in everything that we do. In your name. Amen. Thank you again for joining us. Uh, if you would appreciate uh, being prayed for, we have a virtual prayer room. Uh, there's a Zoom link that you can uh, click on to get through to that if that would be useful to you. But otherwise, I hope you have a fantastic week. God bless. Bye-bye.